a review, let's just consider now the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Beginning in verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. Now in those first three verses, once again, that we considered last week, we see here a description of faith. These three verses should give us somewhat of a definition, a description, an understanding. But it's important for us to ask the question as well, and for some of you it may be a review, but why was faith important to this young church? Some of you considered this in your life groups over this past week. Why was faith important to them? What is it that faith accomplished? Remember that this young church, at one point, they had, uh, as, as, as Jews, they had accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They recognized, my Messiah has come. And they expressed saving faith in Him. And in the very beginning, as Hebrews tells us, they were on fire for the Lord. In fact, so much so that they even endured trial and tribulation with, with joy. They joyfully, as the word says, accepted the plundering of their goods, meaning people came and they treated them poorly. People stole from them. They were rejected from family and friends. And they saw it all as a blessing because they knew that they were being persecuted for their faith. And that sounds crazy to some people. But we know, and those of you whose faith has been strengthened and you've been walking with the Lord for a while, and you know Scripture, you know that that's what we're called to. Uh, that this world doesn't understand that we are just strangers passing through. And so, faith for this young Hebrew church was important because it was their faith that caused them to trust. It was their faith that caused them to hope. It was their faith that got them through those difficult times. But as we well know, they began to struggle a little bit in their faith. Time had gone by and they began to grow weary. And, and, and a new wave of persecution was coming and for some of them they considered the idea of just turning back. They considered it. They thought about the idea of just going back of going back into the Jewish faith, of going back to a place that would be comfortable for them, going back to a place where persecution wouldn't be as severe against them any longer, going back to a place where they could have uh, just peaceful relationships in some cases with family and friends. They were considering this. But the author of Hebrews compels them, exhorts them, says, don't turn back. Don't look back. If you do, if you walk away from this, there's no other sacrifice for you. There's nothing else that can save you. You need to press on. And so here as we come into the latter part of chapter 10 and, and then all of chapter 11, the author of Hebrews says, look, you're to have faith, you're to hope, you're to trust. And he begins to give us an understanding of what it is that faith accomplishes. And if you recall from last week, we know, and by the scripture here, verses 1 through 3, that faith brings substance. Faith gives you something that you can hang on to. Faith gives you something meaningful that you can hold on to in the trials of your life. It makes a future hope, the things that we look for in the future, the things that we hope, that it makes those things a present reality. Faith allows us to live each day believing and trusting that God's promises are true. There is a future certainty when we have faith. If you are a born-again believer today, if you are walking by faith, you should trust you should know, you should have the joy that comes with, I have eternal life in heaven. That no matter how bad this gets, no matter how tough the day may be, there should be something that overwhelms you on a regular basis as you recognize and realize that I have the promise of eternal life in heaven with my Lord and Savior. Folks, if that doesn't get you excited, if there's not moments throughout your week where, that, where the knowledge of that alone doesn't cause you to say, hey, praise God. This momentary and light affliction doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to the promise that I have. And so it should make that future hope, it should make it a present reality for you. There's also a visual certainty that comes with faith. It is not a blind faith. It isn't something that you just have to say, okay, I just trust in it and it really just doesn't make any sense at all, but I'm just going to go ahead and believe. 
I think a lot of times we use that language, and I don't think it's necessarily fitting because faith does give us sight. It allows us to see the world differently. It allows us to have a different perspective. It allows us to, to be able to look at things and go, man, there, God is at work here. You may see this, but I see this. Many of you are familiar with the old uh, tale of, uh, of a man who is uh, working along the side of the road, and, and somebody's walking along, and they see him. It's in a third world country, and here this man's making brick on the side of the road. And he just looks absolutely just like he hates his work. And, and, and the person who's walking along comes up to him and says, Sir, why do you look so sad? And he says, oh, just all I, all I do all day long is make brick. It's so boring, it's so hot, it's so tiring. I just get tired. The same thing over and over and over again. And as the man continues to walk along, he sees another man doing the exact same thing. Making, doing the exact same job. And he looks so happy. He looks so joyful. He's just, he's just full of life. And he comes up to him and says, Sir, why are you so happy? You look so joyful, especially compared to this guy down here. What is it that you're doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. You see the difference? Perspective is everything. And our faith gives us perspective. That even in the midst of trials, even when we see things that don't seem to be going our way, we can look at it and in faith we can say, God is up to something. God is at work. Faith gives us sight. And all of this then gives us the right perspective, especially as the author of Hebrews says, of God's creation and his lordship over it. Then we can walk outside today and we can look around and we can say, holy smokes. This world is an amazing place. And what's even more incredible is it isn't even, it doesn't even compare to what it was intended to be. That one day, these things that amaze me, these things that I look at and say, God, your creation is absolutely wonderful. It's amazing. It's beautiful. That it pales in comparison to what you have in store for us. You know, I, I love getting up early in the morning. And one of the things I love about the morning is when I can see the sun coming up and light starts to, to give way through the trees. And when that happens, the birds start to chirp and all of creation begins to awake. And you know what the crazy thing about it is? It happens every morning. It's so faithful. No matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm not doing, it just happens. God's, the, the sun comes up. The birds begin to chirp. His creation begins to awaken. And it's a wonderful thing. And I can look at that as a believer and say, God, you're so good. You're so faithful. Our faith allows us to see that. Now, what does all of that produce, this, this idea of faith? But as, as the author wants us to see, it produces perseverance then. It gives us the hope that we need. And it's the hope that allows us then to endure those trials, to press on, to persevere. And this was the goal. For, for them to persevere, that they, would, that they would continue on. Recall in, in, in Romans chapter 5, we read this last week in 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Hope doesn't disappoint. Now the author gives us a description here of faith, and he's going to begin sharing testimonies of faith. The great hall of faith. <coughs> now it's important to remember as we set off on this journey, and we consider these great heroes of the faith, that certainly their lives bear testimony. We should give consideration to their lives. They are an example to us, and that is for sure. But lest we fall into the trap of merely sort of moralizing their lives, right? If we, it, sometimes we have a tendency to do that. We can sort of look at the individuals throughout the Old Testament. We can just sort of look at their lives individually and say, oh, what a great example. I should be more like so-and-so. Or oh, look at Moses. I should be like Moses. Or look at Abel. I should be like Abel. You should. We should today look at the story of Abel and to say, wow, what an example. I should seek to emulate that more. But if we do that and that alone, we're missing something. And we're missing what I think the author of Hebrews really wants us to see here. And that is that we must not fail to consider the grand narrative of Scripture. What the author wants us to see here is to consider the Old Testament saints 
And, and to see these people who persevered, but also people who believed and persevered. Now, what is it that they believe in? What was their faith in? It was in Jesus, well before Jesus came. You see, that's what we often sometimes miss as we look at these, these people in scriptures. We can look at their lives and say, wow, they lived a great life. But we don't necessarily look at their faith and consider what was their faith in long before Jesus came to this earth. And they said, I believe, I trust, I hope in the Messiah who will come. And so we then miss, if we don't see that, we then miss how Jesus is woven through the entire narrative of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The author of Hebrews wants his listeners to read the Old Testament Christologically. And as we consider their stories, to look at them within the storyline of the gospel. That these people lived by faith and that they were looking to a redeemer. And that because they were looking to the redeemer, it produced perseverance and faith. Now, there is much to be learned from each of their examples. So it's fitting that in the author's consideration of their great faith, that he goes back to the beginning, to the dawn of time. As he begins to give uh, this church and, and, and through the Holy Spirit, us as well, an example of faith, he goes back to the beginning. And it's a wonderful thing that he begins with a righteous man by the name of Abel. And we read in verse 4, and let's read it again, by faith, and we're going to see that I think upwards of 36 times throughout this chapter, by faith, by faith, by faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. This, this term, more excellent, could also read acceptable or better, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. Now, in order to truly understand and appreciate this first account of faith, we need to go back to the Old Testament, and we need to consider that story. So let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and we'll go through 1 through 15 here. Now, here in the beginning, in verse 1, we read, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now Adam and Eve at this point had been removed, expelled from the garden. In the first three chapters, we have the account of creation, the history of creation, we have Adam and Eve in the garden in paradise. They were there. They were given a home. They were given a place where they had everything. And the garden was for them. And it was paradise. But as we know, uh, sin entered in. Man was deceived. Man was willfully disobedient. And because of that, sin entered the world. And so God, in his mercy and in his grace, uh, was not done with Adam and Eve. He still sought to care for them, to cover them. But for them to remain in the garden could not be. Uh, because there in the garden was the tree of life. And so in man's sin, to continue to eat of the tree of life and to perpetuate that sin forever, God would not allow. And they were expelled from the garden and from many of the blessings of God. And so now we find Adam and Eve living outside of the garden. And now they're experiencing, yes, blessings still, the blessings of, of children and, and all the things that we still enjoy in this world today. However, they were also experiencing the consequences of sin. They were experiencing the consequences of sin. And so here now, they're growing their family. And, and so Cain's born and then Abel. And it tells us that, that uh, uh, Abel was a keeper of sheep. Okay, he was a shepherd. Abel dealt with animals. And Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain was a farmer. Okay, so these are two brothers. One, one worked with the animals. The other worked out in the field and tilled the ground. And we continue here in verse 3. And in the process of time... It came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Okay, now, real quickly here in verse 3, some of your Bibles may read here, uh, and at the end of days. That would be the literal translation. Why is it important for us to mention that? Well, one of the things, some of you, as you think about Cain and Abel at this point, because you just heard about them being born, and now they're bringing an offering, and you might picture them as teenagers. You might picture them as young men. Okay? What we need to understand here that's often not considered in this language here at the end of days, they're very old at this point. Now, old is a relative term at this point, but they're well over 100 years old at this point, Cain and Abel. 
Okay, that's something we don't often consider. Okay? Now, that's going to bear some significance as we continue to consider this story here this morning. So I'll come back to that. In verse 4, then, we read, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, verse 7, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. It's kind of an interesting passage of scripture, right? A bit of a strange story if you just sort of consider it at face value. And it's one, this, 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 this word or this name, Cain, has one that has uh, become a part of our language. People use this word, Cain, uh, in, in, even in, in non-religious uh, ways, just speaking to one who has such anger, one who's a murderer. And so, indeed, it's a strange story, but what we need to consider here again, within the primary passage of our, uh, of our scripture for today, to begin to connect the dots here. So I'm going to read for us again in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. We just read that account. And through this, he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. And so, really, as we consider this verse here today, verse 4, there are three components to this verse and the account of Abel's faith that I want us to look at today. And they teach us a great deal, or should, about our own faith. See, this is why the author of Hebrews draws our attention to this. It is a unusual story. It is an unfortunate story, but it's intended to teach us something. And the author of Hebrews grabs onto this story from the Old Testament as a way of helping us to understand what should our faith look like. And so the first thing that we see within this today is the sacrifice itself. That's the first component that we should consider. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent, acceptable, better sacrifice than Cain. And so, as we look here first at Abel's sacrifice, and we see that it was, it was more excellent, the question should be, why? Because here in this passage of Scripture, there in Genesis, it doesn't necessarily tell us why. Why was Abel's sacrifice better? All we see is that both of them brought a sacrifice. The Lord respected one and didn't respect or receive the other one. But as you think about it, Cain... He had brought the best of what he had, did he not? Cain was a farmer, Abel a shepherd. It seems reasonable that each man would bring his best offering to the Lord, the thing that he was responsible for, that he would bring that to the Lord and say, here's my offering. Yet, God does not accept Cain's sacrifice. Why, why do you suppose that that was? Now, I would submit to you this morning that it's two things. One is that it is not what God wanted. That it wasn't the sacrifice that God had asked for. Now admittedly, that may lean more towards speculation, and there are some that debate that particular piece there. That it was less about the sacrifice itself, and more about the heart behind it. And I would agree that I think that's the second component of why Cain's sacrifice was not received. Both that it was not what God wanted, and that it was not brought in faith. 
And so you see here, and this is what we need to start to understand here this morning, less about the narrative and more as it applies to us and our understanding of it, is to bring a sacrifice is to worship. Okay? So differently here than sort of this maybe foreign concept of bringing a sacrifice to the altar, what we need to understand and what may be, may be more uh, relatable to us is that to bring a sacrifice to the altar means to bring work to worship, to worship God. Today, when we worship, it is not simply that we sing. For a lot of people within the church today, they would say worship is over. That was at the beginning of the service, and then we'll go back uh, the service, and then we'll go back to it at the end for one more song. That is not your worship, at least not all of it. That's part of it. That's your praise. And so we say praise and worship. And, and if you caught it today, when I prayed, I said, Lord, may our worship continue in our study of your word. And so we need to understand that, that it's not just about singing. Certainly that's a part of it. But when we bring our worship, what we're bringing and should be is a sacrifice. No differently than that this time. Now, don't worry. Next Sunday you don't need to bring in an animal and say, okay, I'm ready. To, we're not implementing a sacrificial system here. Why? Well, you know, Hebrews has been telling us all about that, Right? You see, we, we, we can begin to connect the dots of what the author of Hebrews was trying to say in that, listen, that's done. There has been one sacrifice now that's been made, and that's Jesus Christ. And he atones for your sin once and for all. You don't need to continue to bring your animal sacrifice. What you do need to bring in the form of a sacrifice is what? You. You bring you. You are what you bring as a sacrifice in worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2. What I've challenged many of you to memorize. Therefore I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to what? Offer your body a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Some translations say what? Acceptable. Now think about what the author of Hebrews here is saying as it relates to Abel's offering. It was acceptable. You see, we, we are our acceptable sacrifice to bring ourselves to the altar and to throw it out there and to say, Lord, I'm yours. And so your worship is about bringing your life. And so when we sing and when we study the word and when we pray and when we take communion and we do all of these different things that go on within the context of church, it's all worship. If through it all you're saying, here's my life. Here's my life. I'm yours, Lord. And so that's what we need to understand here as it relates to the comparison between Abel and Cain. Now at this time, their sacrifices here, they were worship. Okay, this was their way of worshiping God. And by God's rejection of it, he communicates, this is not what I want. This isn't what I wanted from Cain. Both in terms of the sacrifice itself and the heart behind it. Now, God's rejection of the sacrifice suggests to me, that it is not what he desires. Yet Abel's sacrifice, he accepted. This likely goes back, and, and, and so let's deal here first with what I believe uh, is related to the, the sacrifice itself, the animal sacrifice as opposed to that from the ground. I do believe that there was a pattern that was set for them. Now, we'll see elsewhere in Scripture that uh, you can bring a sacrifice of your first fruit, certainly. So I'm not suggesting that a grain offering is not acceptable. But I think here in this context, it does fit. And, and, it, and, and there was a pattern that was given to them. You ever wonder how they got the idea in the first place to offer an animal as a sacrifice? <laughs> here it is, all, here it is in, 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 in chapter 4 of Genesis... We're not very far into Scripture here at this point, and yet they're bringing an animal sacrifice. And nowhere did it give them a specific instruction as of yet, at least in terms of what we see, what's recorded in Scripture, that they were to bring an animal sacrifice. Yet they were doing it. Why? I think this goes back to what we see in Genesis 3.21. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, and then they were naked in the garden, and they were hiding because they were aware for the first time, they were aware of their nakedness and they were ashamed. And, and not that differently than when God calls out to Cain. I love how God does this. He does it in our own lives too. He says, hey, where are you? And Adam and Eve hiding behind the bush with some fig leaves trying to, you know, cover themselves up. 
think, oh, we're going to hide from God. You hear? You hear he's asking where we are? He doesn't know. He doesn't know where we are. Wow, you really misunderstand who God is, right? God's just giving you the benefit of the doubt here. And it's, I'm going to give him the opportunity to say, here I am. Because he knows exactly where we are. How many times has God said to you, hey, where are you? Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere. Why is it when somebody asks us what we're doing, nothing? <laughs> we are too doing something, right? We know we're doing something. Where are you? I know exactly where I'm at, but I know you don't want me to be here. And I know it's my sin that got me into this place. And I'd just rather say nothing at all. And hope that you just pass on by. That you are not an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God. So he knows. And he cries out to Adam and he, where are you? And here's the thing. that So are they, in their sin, hiding from God, thinking, oh, he's going to be mad. He's going to be mad. He's going to be really mad. He's going to take, oh man, he's going to punish us. What does he do? What we see happen immediately is that he takes them and he covers them. Covers them. And there in the garden, I believe, we see the first sacrifice. Two innocent lambs, having done not, nothing wrong, pure, spotless, perfect. And they, for the first time, see blood. They see sacrifice. And it becomes apparent to them that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And there sets forth for them a pattern. A pattern by which they would be covered. And no differently in our own lives, when we hide and we run and we think God's going to be mad, how can he forgive me? How can I do this? All, all those questions that you're asking in terms of how can I do this and I feel ashamed, well, you are feeling those things. But remember, and this is a lesson we always need to make sure we never forget. Condemnation causes us to run from God. Conviction draws us to him. And so if you're feeling like you should run from God, that you can't be near him, that you can't let him see you, you need to remember right away that's condemnation. That's not from the Lord. That's from the enemy. For if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. That's where we read there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so you see, conviction is a good thing. It, it makes us aware of our sin. It causes us to go, man, I did something I shouldn't do. And you're right about that. But you should run to the Creator. You should run to God the Father such that He can clothe you. And you see, God was giving Cain the opportunity. Cain, where is your brother? And in that moment, I absolutely believe that Cain could have said, God, I did something I shouldn't have done, and I'm sorry. And he could have repented, and God would have covered him. But instead, Cain says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Foolishly thinking that he could fool God, and of course, God already knew. And so he begins to run from God. And it's then only after the consequences of sin come in that he begins to go, oh, oh, no. And so you see, I do believe that a pattern was set for them as it relates to sacrifice. As I've already said, Hebrews 9.22 itself declares that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But as Hebrews also points us to, the sacrifice was insufficient in atoning for sin once and for all. So we know that the sacrifices themselves point to something greater. And I believe that that's what Abel had faith in. That he was expressing faith and he was recognizing that there must be shed blood for my sin. But that it also points to something greater. It points to something better. And so we can then begin to understand that Abel's offering of an animal in faith and God knowing his heart that he was looking to something future. Whereas Cain, it was just another offering. And therein lies the heart issue for Cain as well. And so let me ask you, to pause from the story for a moment, let me ask you, how is your worship, friends? How is your worship? Abel offered better worship in faith. Because his faith was an expression of his conscious need for atonement. And it was offered in obedience. You see, Abel's sacrifice was better because there was faith that came along with it. 
faith in something greater, and his sacrifice was also in obedience. How is your worship? How is your sacrifice? Cain, on the other hand, will consider once more his offering came from his own way. And it came from his own understanding. And it came in disobedience. You see, we have a very brief account of Cain elsewhere in the New Testament. And it's in the book of Jude in verse 11. And it reads there, woe to them. Whenever you see woe in scripture, watch out. You could say, whoa, there's a woe, right? I got to pay attention to this. Woe to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. The way of Cain. What is the way of Cain? Well, in the context of Jude, and in what Jude is addressing there, he's addressing fakes, posers, false teachers, those who have a form of godliness. He's addressing those who are religious, but they are empty. Empty religion. And it's empty religion, and, and, and it proves true because in the rejection of the sacrifice, Cain doesn't repent. He doesn't say he's sorry. He, he sulks. And God even warns him. Sin is lying at the door, Cain. Do you know this? Do you know where you're headed? Do you know the slippery slope that you're on? And folks, that's what empty religion does for us. Nothing. It simply puts us in a position where sin lies at the door. And we'll easily indulge other things and think we're fooling God. God says to him, sin's at your door. And in other words, he's saying, be careful. And then Cain goes into a fit of rage and he murders his brother. And then he lies about it. So once again, I'd ask today, how is your worship today? Abel's worship was one of obedience and faith. Cain's worship was one of disobedience and faith in himself. It was an offering of pride and self-righteousness. And woe to each of us if what we bring in our worship is an offering of pride, an offering of self-righteousness, or an offering of empty religion, just going through the motions. I don't like this song. I'm not singing the words to this song. It's not the right key. I don't like drums. Drums are too loud. That guitar is electric. It has no business in the church. Worship was great today. Worship team was on point. Man, they sounded awesome. Man, they're so talented. Oh, I love worship. Message was so-so. <laughs> wasn't what I needed. It didn't really apply to me. Communion. Grape juice is a little funky. <laughs> Not Welch's. <laughs> oh, they've got those things now, you know, you peel it open. It's all the communion in one. Do you see what we do? Where's your worship in that? Where's your offering in that? And listen, you're responsible for that. Yes, I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, I have no responsibility here. Trust me, there's plenty of things that I look at on a regular basis as it relates to our church facility and our services, and I go, oh, Lord, I want to do this better. Oh, Lord, I'd like to improve this. But listen, none of that really matters if we, like Abel, come to him in obedience and in faith and say, Lord, this is about me and you. It's, it's my worship and it's my sacrifice. And Lord, I'm giving you myself here. And I don't care if it's off tune or it doesn't really feel like it applies to me or tastes funny. None of those things matter, Lord. It's here I am, Lord, offering myself on the altar, a living sacrifice. Lord, accept me. Listen, our Father longs for those. He longs for those who will come and worship him with complete devotion, in obedience to his word, and with an attitude of absolute surrender and dependence on him. That's what it's all about. Do you get that? As you read scripture from beginning to end, do you know what it's about? 
It's about Him. It's all about Him. Everything is intended to point us to Him. It's all about worship of Him. I referenced this on Wednesday night, and ladies, you're studying through this in Ecclesiastes as, Sol as, as Solomon goes on this just wild ride to sort of figure out the answer to all these things in life. He comes back to one thing. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is man's all. It's about Him. Jesus summed it up. All the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It begins with Him, and it ends with Him, and everything in between is about Him. And so how fitting is it here that in our understanding of faith, the very first example that we're given is one who rightly understood true worship. And so you see, faith is born out of one who rightly sees that God is worthy of it all, who worships in spirit and truth. This is where it begins. And so, Christian, I would say, how is your worship? How is your sacrifice? Is it, is it right? Is it authentic? Does it begin in the right place? Because if it does, then all of the other things will begin to come along with it. As we see in this one simple verse, and let's look at these, and we'll go through these a bit more quicker here. Let's, the second portion of the verse now, it says, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. You see, true, authentic, obedient faith makes us righteous. It makes you righteous. If you look in, in though I'd love to attempt to, we won't read Romans 2 through 8 today, okay? I'll spare you reading you six chapters. But I would challenge you to go and read those chapters. Because what you'll see at the beginning of Romans chapter 2 is God's righteous judgment. His righteous judgment. How we're all guilty. And then he goes on, Paul goes on to defend God's judgment. To essentially say, you deserve it. You deserve it. But then, he, and, and, and so he then goes on to say that everyone has sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. But then he begins to shift and to tell us about how we have righteousness in him and through him. And, and, and he emphasizes the fact that it comes from him such that we wouldn't boast. And then he goes on to give examples similar to what we have here of Abraham who was justified and made righteous because of his faith. And David similarly and the promise that came through faith. And just as we read this morning... Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on then to talk about being dead to sin and alive to God, to move from slaves of sin to slaves of God. And then to understand how we've been freed from the law and what the law was intended to show us and where it brings us to such that he begins to summarize it here in God's everlasting love, saying, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us who can be against us? You see, true, authentic, and obedient faith makes us righteous. Do you understand that? That when you come to him in obedience and faith, pouring yourself out to him, not caring about anything else other than saying, Lord, I'm yours, that he declares you righteous. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, not having my own righteousness, which is a form, or excuse me, which is from the law, but that which is through Christ, the righteousness which is from God, by faith. And so in our faith and our obedience, we are accounted as righteousness, which then leads to the third aspect of Abel's testimony here, as he says, and through it, he being dead still speaks. And so true worship, true worship produces true righteousness, which produces a true witness. You see, Abel's life still speaks. And it should prompt us to wonder, what does my life say? What does my life say? Long after I'm gone, what will my witness say? And now I'm not talking to you about your name. This isn't about names on a sign or on a building. This isn't about your legacy in terms of, of, of what will people say when your name is brought up necessarily, but rather are people marveling at your life and how your life pointed them to Christ. 
I have a quote that I see on a regular basis. It's always in front of me. I need it in front of me all the time. I believe that every pastor should have it in front of them. And it simply says, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. That is how, and I fail at it on a regular basis, and that's why I need it in front of me, the reminder of what I'm called to do. And I would say that it's no different for me than any one of you. Such that when anybody thinks about you or talks about you, it's not about you. But it's about Him. That your life points to Him. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, there he says, and I paraphrase, there is nothing that I've sought to accomplish amongst you other than to know Christ and Him crucified. To make Him known. The Apostle Paul, he had every opportunity to come in and boast to be an example, to say, well, look what I've done. And consistently, over and over and over again, he puts Christ first. He says, no, not me, him. Look to him. So in closing, we'll begin to close here. I'm going to let the worship team close us out in song. I'd ask you the question again. How is your worship? How is your worship? Are you in faith? A real, genuine faith that makes the future present, the invisible seen. Are you in that faith offering obedient and authentic worship? Worship that obtains righteousness, not by your works, but because you depend on Him. And that faith then produces an effective witness that points people to Christ. Do you see the awesome pattern that comes through the example of one man? There are two ways before you. The way of Abel that recognizes the need for a Savior and in humility and dependence offers a living sacrifice that is your life and worship to Him. Or there's the way of Cain, which in pride says, I'll do it my way and I'll continue an empty religion and ritual. Which will it be? you got an opportunity right now. you got an opportunity right now in this moment as you begin to sing this song to get right with the Lord, if that's you, if you're going the way of Cain. Listen, I'm not suggesting you're going to go out and murder somebody today. Far be it. But what does Jesus say of murder? He sets a high standard, he raises his right ear. If you even hate the brother. And so sin is always crouching at our door. It's always there. The warning is always there. But if you, in regular obedience and in faith, come and your worship is right, and you say, Lord, it's just about you. And daily, Lord, I just give you my life. In faith, Lord, trust in you. All, you're all I have and you're all I need. And so, Lord, I offer you my life. And, Lord, thank you for making me righteous out of anything I've done or can do. Lord, you declare me righteous. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, would you just take me and use me? And may my life, in, 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 in being an offering to you, serve to point others to you, Lord Jesus. That's what we have the opportunity to do. Or you can just go through the motion and say, hey, I'll quit. Sing the song, head on out. And I do it again. Where's your heart? Get it right with him. <laughs>